On November 15, 1963, the President of the United States came to New York City to address the Fifth Constitutional Convention of the AFL CIO. It was by no means the first time John F. Kennedy had been among us. He came as an old friend. He was, as he had often said, no stranger to trade union meetings. We had known him well during his service in the House and Senate. He worked with us and we worked with him on many legislative proposals for the benefit of the nation. And when the time came, we enthusiastically supported him for the presidency. Far more than any of his predecessors, John F. Kennedy continued his close ties with the labor movement. He spoke at union conventions whenever his schedule permitted. He invited trade union officials to the White House for consultation and discussion. And the program he urged for America was one which had, and still has, the full backing of the Air Havel CIO. So it was not only as the President of the United States that John F. Kennedy came to the convention. The 4,000 men and women who filled the hall to overflowing greeted him with affection, with the warmth of old friendship, and with pride that such a man was leading the fight for the principles and the program to which the trade union movement is dedicated. He was by right a delegate to that convention. It was a happy occasion for John F. Kennedy's own love of life, his gayness, and his gallantry had a way of lifting the spirits of everyone in his presence. It is difficult even now to realize that one week later, almost to the hour, John F. Kennedy would be shot dead by an assassin on the streets of Dallas, Texas, in the most terrible crime of our generation. No one in the convention dreamed that John F. Kennedy was speaking his last words to labor. We in the AFL CIO believe these last words, this historic occasion, should be part of the record of our time. Fortunately, we had arranged to have the proceedings of the convention film. It is that address on that happy occasion which you will now see. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Executive Council, fellow delegates, ladies and gentlemen. The other day I read in a newspaper where Senator Goldwater asked for Labor's support before 2,000 cheering Illinois businessmen. <laughs> I, I've come here to ask Labor's support for a program for the United States. I'm glad to come to this convention, and I think that the AFL-CIO, at this convention, and looking back over the years, over this century, can take pride in the actions it has taken, pride in the stands it has made, pride in the things it's done, not only for the American labor movement, but for the United States as a whole. It is no accident. I think that those who oppose what we're trying to do today could recall the comparative history of the years between World War I and II and the years since World War II. The 20 year period from 1919 to 1939 was marked by an 11-year depression, a two-year depression, eight years of stagnation in the 20s on the farms of America, and all of the efforts which were made in the 30s against almost 
comparable opposition, and on occasions even greater than what we do today, all of the efforts which were made in the 30s and later carried out in the administration of President Truman, I think have made it possible for us to have a far different history from 1945 through to 1965. Those 20 years, 1919 to 1939, those years from 1945 through 1965, tell the story of the progress which Franklin Roosevelt made in the 30s and on which we now live and benefit in the 1960s. It is no accident, it is no accident that this country staggered through 20 years. And it's no accident. It didn't just merely happen that this country has steadily increased in wealth and strength in the years from 1945 on. It is because of the steps that were taken in the 30s to lay the foundation for progress in the 40s and 50s and 60s that make it possible for us to meet in these circumstances. And our obligation in the 1960s is to do those things in the Congress of the United States and in the various states which will make it possible for others in the 1970s and 1980s to continue to live in prosperity. <laughs> Three years ago and one week, by a landslide, the people of the United States elected me to the presidency <laughs> of this country. And, I th and it is possible that you had something to do with that majority of 112,000 votes. <laughs> and I think it therefore appropriate to say something about what we've done, and even more appropriate to say something about what we must do. With your help and support, with your concern, we have worked to try to improve the lot of the people of the United States. In the last three years abroad, we have doubled the number of nuclear weapons in our strategic alert forces. In the last three years, we've increased by 45% the number of combat-ready Army divisions. We've increased by 600% the number of our counterinsurgency forces increased by 175% our procurement of airlift aircraft and doubled our Polaris and Minuteman program. The United States is stronger today than ever before in our history. And with that strength, we work for peace. <laughs> and here in the United States, We've encouraged the peaceful desegregation of schools in 238 districts, theaters in 144 cities, restaurants in 129 cities, and lunch counters in 100 cities, while at the same time taking executive action to open doors to our citizens in transportation terminals and polling places and public and private employment. And finally, we've been working to strengthen the economy of the United States. Through the Area Redevelopment Act of 61, through the Public Works Acceleration Act of 62, through the Manpower Development and Training Act of 62, we've increased industry's ability and desire to hire men through the most extensive and promising Trade Expansion Act in our history, through the most comprehensive Housing and Urban Renewal Act of all time through liberalized depreciation guidelines and through over a billion dollar loans to small businessmen. We have boosted the purchasing power and relieved the distress of some of those least able to take care of themselves by increasing the minimum wage to a dollar and a quarter, which is still much too low. and expanding its coverage by three and a half million, which is still too little, by increasing, by increasing Social Security benefits to men and women who can retire at the age of 62, by, 
by granting for the first time in the history of the United States public assistance to several hundred thousand children of unemployed fathers and by extending the benefits of nearly three million jobless workers. By doing these things and others, we have attempted to work for the benefit of our people. And I can assure you that if we can obtain, and I see no good reason why we should not, if we can obtain the prompt passage of the pending $11 billion tax reduction bill, we will be sailing by next April on the winds of the longest and strongest peacetime expansion in the history of the United States. Our national output three years ago was $500 billion. In January, three years later, it will be $600 billion, a record rise of $100 billion in 36 months. For the first time in history, we have 70 million men and women at work. For the first time in history, factory earnings have exceeded $100 a week, and even the stock market has broken all records, though we only get credit when it goes down. <laughs> the average factory worker takes home $10 a week more than he did three years ago, and two and a half million people more are at work. In fact, if the economy during the last two and a half years had grown at the same lagging pace which it did in the last two and a half years of the 50s, unemployment today would be 8%. In short, we have made progress, but all of us know that more progress must be made. That's what we're here about. I'm here today to talk about the right to work, the right to have a job in this country in a time of prosperity in the United States. That's the real right to work issue of 1963. In spite of this progress, this country must move so fast to even stand still. Productivity goes up so fast. The number of people coming into the labor market so increase. 10 million more jobs are needed in the next two and a half years. Even with this astonishing economic progress, which in the last 18 months has meant that the United States has grown faster economically than France and Germany, than any country in Europe but two, even with this extraordinary economic progress in the last 18 months, we still have an unemployment rate of five and a half percent, four million people out of work, Productivity goes up so fast. So many millions come into the labor market that unless we have the most extraordinary economic progress in the history of our country, we cannot possibly make a dent in the five and a half percent figure. So while we take some satisfaction in what we've done and tried to do, this group more than any knows how much we still have left to do. And I hope the day will never come, nor do I predict it, when the AF of LCIO will be satisfied with anything less than the best. Yeah. Four million people are out of work. All of the people who oppose the efforts we're making to try to improve the economic climate of the United States, who talk to us so long about socialism and deficits and all the rest should look at that figure. Four million people out of work. And judging from last summer's statistics, three times that many have experienced some unemployment. And that hanging over the labor market makes it more difficult for those of you who speak for labor at the bargaining table to speak with force when there are so many people out of work. It affects the whole economic climate. That's why I think that this issue of economic security of jobs is the basic issue facing the United States in 1963. And I wish we could get everybody talking about it. A quarter of the people we're talking about are out of work 15 weeks or longer, and their families feel it. This is a year of prosperity, of record prosperity. And 1954 was a year of recession. 
Yet our unemployment rate is as high today as it was in 1954. Last year's loss of man hours in terms of those willing but unable to find full-time work was a staggering one billion workdays lost, equivalent to shutting down the entire country for three weeks with no pay. That is an intolerable waste for this rich country of ours. And that's why I say that economic security is the number one issue today. It is not so recognized by everyone. There are those who oppose the tax cut, the youth employment bill, who oppose more money for depressed areas and job retraining and other public needs, and they are powerful and articulate. They are campaigning on a platform of so-called individual initiative. They talk loudly of deficits and socialism, but they do not have a single constructive job-creating program of their own, and they oppose the efforts that we are making. And I do not believe And I do not believe that selling TVA is a program to put people to work. <laughs> there are those who support our efforts for jobs, but say it isn't the number one issue. Some may say that civil rights is the number one issue. This nation needs the passage of our bill if we are to fulfill our constitutional obligations. But no one gains from a fair employment practice bill, if there is no employment to be had, no one gains by being admitted to a lunch counter if he has no money to spend. No one gains from attending a better school if he doesn't have a job after graduation. No one thinks much of the right to own a good home and to sleep in a good hotel or go to the theater if he has no work and no money. Civil rights legislation is important, but to make that legislation effective, we need jobs in the United States. And some may say that the number one domestic issue is education. And this nation must improve its education. What concerns me almost more than anything is the statistic that there will be eight million young boys and girls coming into the labor market in the 60s who have not graduated from high school. Where are they going to find jobs? Which of your unions going to be able to put them to work? Eight million of them. But the best schools, the best teachers, the best books, all these are of no avail if there are no jobs. The out of work college graduate is just as much out of work as a school dropout. The family beset by unemployment cannot send a child to college. It may even encourage him to drop out of high school to find a job which he will not keep. Education is a key to the growth of this country. We must educate our children as our most valuable resource. We must make it possible for those who have talent to go to college, but only if those who are educated can find a job. If jobs are the most important domestic issue that this country faces, then clearly no single step can now be more important in sustaining the economy of the United States than the passage of our tax bill. <laughs> For this will help consumer markets and build investment demand and build business incentives and therefore provide jobs for a total addition to the economy of the United States in the next months of nearly $30 billion. We dare not wait for this tax cut until it's too late, as perhaps some would have. On the average, this nation's period of peacetime expansion before the downturn comes leading to a recession, on the average, it has lasted 28 months since 1920 and 32 months since the end of the Second World War. Today, we are already in our 33rd month of economic expansion, and we urgently need that tax cut as insurance against a recession next year. And we need that cut where it will do the most good. And the benefits, mostly, 
will go to those two or three million people who will, out of that bill, find new jobs. But tax cuts are not enough, and jobs are not enough, and higher earnings and greater growth and record prosperity are not enough unless that prosperity is used to sustain a better society. We can take real pride in a $600 billion economy and 70 million jobs only when they are underwriting to the fullest extent possible to improve our schools, to rebuild our cities, to counsel our youth, to assure our health, and to care for our aged and infirm. The House Ways and Means Committee will open its hearings on a bill too long delayed to provide hospital insurance for our older citizens. <laughs> These hearings are desirable, but the facts are known. Our older and retired workers are sick more often and for longer periods than the rest of the population. Their income is only half of that of our younger citizens. They cannot afford either the rising cost of hospital care or the rising cost of hospital insurance. Their children cannot afford to pay hospital bills for three generations, for their children, for themselves, and for their parents. I have no doubt that most children are willing to try to do it, but they cannot. And I think that the United States should meet its responsibilities as a proud and resourceful country. I cannot tell whether we're going to get this legislation before Christmas, but I can say that I believe that this Congress will not go home next summer to the people of the United States without passing this bill. I think we should stay there till we do. Abraham Lincoln said 100 years ago, all that serves labor serves the nation. And I want to express my appreciation for the actions which this organization has taken under the leadership of Mr. Meany, both at home and abroad, to strengthen the United States, to support assistance to those who are trying to be free, to make it possible in this hemisphere for labor organizations to be organized so that wealth can be more fairly distributed. I saw coming in here a housing project, $10 million, which the AFL-CIO is putting into a housing project in Mexico. This hemisphere is our home, and I cannot understand, as I read the debates of the Senate, and as I said yesterday, why it is possible for the Soviet Union, with one half the wealth of the United States, to put as much resources and money and assistance into the single island of Cuba, with six million people, as this rich country does in its own backyard for all of the countries of Latin America. Can somebody explain that to me? <laughs> strength abroad and strength at home. And strength abroad and strength at home in the final analysis depends upon the vitality of the economy of the United States. If we move from recession to recession, if we are unable to master our economic problems and permit them to master us, if we move into a recession in 64 and demonstrate that the cycle which has been traditional is still with us, if we end up that recession with eight or nine million people out of work, what then is going to be said about the leader of the West? What we are attempting to do affects not only your members, but all of the people of this country. And all those who are around the world depend upon us. The United States is the keystone in the arch of freedom. However disappointing life may be around the world, the forces of freedom are still in the majority. And they are in the majority after 18 years because the United States has been willing to bear the burden. There are one million Americans serving the United States outside its borders. No country in the history of the world has a comparable record. No country has ever sent so many of its sons and daughters around the globe, not to oppress, but to help people be free. But we can maintain them. 
We can maintain them. We can maintain our commitments. We can strengthen the cause of freedom. We can provide equality of opportunity for our people. Only in the final analysis, if we provide for a growing and buoyant and progressive economy here in the United States. And that is what we're attempting to do. And I come here today and express my appreciation to the AFL-CIO, which in the 1960s is attempting to do what its fathers did in the 1930s in supporting a program of progress for this country of ours. So we ask your help, not next year, now. Marshal Leotay, the great French marshal, went out to his gardener and asked him to plant a tree. And the gardener said, uh, why plant it? It won't flower for 100 years. In that case, the marshal said, plant it this afternoon. That's what we have to do. <laughs> Mr. President, please take your seats. Will the photographers please take their seats? <laughs> May I express to you, Mr. President, on behalf of this great audience, our deep appreciation for the message that you have delivered to us here this morning. There's nothing I could say in any way to embellish your remarks. You have delivered an address that goes to the heart of the problem as we see it. And I can merely say to you, thank you very much. Good. Good.